I had never sat there and, and wondered back and forth or could we have done anything different. I don't think we did a damn thing different. Excuse my French. I, I think that we did everything that we could possibly do with the tools we had. That's the main thing, with the tools we had. In the 60s era of peace and love, college campus communities in Michigan were frozen in fear. Women were disappearing, and eight mutilated bodies of co-eds and a teenage girl were being found in remote areas. John Norman Collins, Michigan's most infamous killer, was convicted of one murder in 1970 and sentenced to life. Well, I always felt he was guilty of murder and binding him. I mean, the, the evidence that they put forward in the trial was pretty, I thought was pretty good. It was pretty excellent. You gotta remember back when they did uh, bind him in, the, the big evidentiary item that convicted him was the, the hair analysis. They found those hairs on Bynum's body and they were able to match them forensically. And that's the first case in the nation that had been done with that. So it was very, very groundbreaking stuff back then. Well, my, my best recollection is it, it, there was DNA found on clothing that belonged to John Norman Collins. The clothing was directly connected to the victim at the time of the crime. And we ended up interviewing him in regards to it. I don't remember how the interview started or what we were even talking about, but I know that at some point I asked a question about Basom. Was he to the point where he wanted to talk about these? Was he still going to deny everything? And Collins got very defensive. He was real defensive. Didn't want to talk about that. Didn't want to talk about that baby. There were times when he became emotional. Um, he cried. The generalized story would be that he initially had denied knowing any of the victims. And when confronted with uh, the question of why his DNA was there, he came up with uh, a story of having um, met the victim. He puts up a real brave college boy front still to this day. But when you say something that makes him mad, he doesn't get mad, he's already mad. It's instantaneous and it, the facial expressions change, the eyes come down and he is lividly pissed off. I think it gave an answer to a certain amount of the public opinion that was wondering, did he do this? Did he not do this? And it really started to become a wonder with Mixer showing that someone completely different did that one, which fueled the importance of let's look at all of them. And now we have one that his DNA is on, so. Well, once you get, if you get somebody admitting something that they denied earlier, not only do you have their own words going against each other, which, you know, you take that to a jury and you've got instant doubt is built right in that what they're saying is bullshit. So you've got that going. But as a detective, it's more like, you know, you're starting to, you're starting to get closer when they start to give little pieces. And a lot of time on a cold case, that's the best you're going to get. Very rare to get a confession on a cold case. And I think the reason for still looking at it, John Norman Collins is old. I mean, he's not old, but he's in his 70s. There's going to come a, a time where the window of catching someone different is just time is going to say, well, the, the likelihood of someone being 110, let's say, is pretty slim. So that window's closing uh, of a new um, suspect. Oh, I, you know, don't get me wrong. I would, I would love to have something materialize from where? From out of nowhere, <laughs> from, from a space alien, alien saying, here, here's the rest of your evidence that you need. 
that we could solve every, so I could go to every single parent and say, this was our guy. We know it was our guy. We know it was. But I can't go to there and say, it was your sister, and I'm sorry. That's all I can do. I'm sorry.